Welcome back, everybody. I'm Sean LaFlock. I'm here with Scotty Hagness. This is Conversations Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity. Scott, how goes it? It's going good here. Yeah, man. You still holding on to that yeah. summer? Uh, it's been warm up until uh, yeah, yesterday, the no, day before yesterday, and then now we, we got a significant cool off. So I don't know if that's our if the last of our hot days for the summer or if they'll come back in September like they do sometimes, but Wow. It's cloudy and about 60-something <laughs> outside right now. Uh, we are in the thick of our summer at this point. This is where it starts to get monotonous. That being said, I will say that our summer has been very mild in my mind, maybe because I'm, I've lost it at this point. I've been down here for too long. <laughs> However, uh, I we haven't had like the constant like afternoon thunderstorms that are usually perennially dominating when it comes to the summers mm. in South Florida, but – like once, maybe twice a week, we get a little rain, and then that's been it. But if you have just that muggy kind of overcast, it's just relentless mugginess. But to me, it hasn't been that bad. We got some heat, but I don't know. Maybe at this point in my life, I've, I've finally acclimated to the South Florida yeah. weather. I just got done with a workout um, that I did with a class, and obviously we don't have AC or anything like that. It was a mile run, 50 wall balls, 40 box jumps, 30 shoulder overhead, and then 20 calories on the rower. And, uh, I felt pretty good on it. Obviously I don't train nearly as much or as much volume as before, but, um, heat management wasn't terrible. So maybe I am finally getting used to this stuff. Nice. Yeah. I have the, the other day it was in the nineties. I was riding in the middle of the day. Yikes. Yeah. This doesn't feel, doesn't feel that bad. I'm used to it. And, uh, so the next day it was exact same temperature, exact same humidity. And for some reason I thought, oh, this is kind of a bit much today, but that was the final day. So. I think I'm having like hot flashes. I think that's what happens. Maybe that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so since last time, uh, just an update, uh, another finding that I've had since kind of uh, doing some uh, TMCC postural restoration uh, exercises to shift mastoid and sphenoid bones. Yeah. I noticed that I can do this with my left side of my mouth now, like smile out of my left side. Oh. So usually I'm on my right side, but now I have like a more balanced You're even, smile. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Usually I'm kind of like here. You know, it's I uh, now that I've gotten a little older, uh-huh. my age my age lines have uh-huh. balanced out a bit. More, but more for pronounced. a long time, I had them only on one side. I hold no shit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was mild, but uh, uh, I thought it, and it probably is because I was, you know, pretty severely injured in a car wreck when I was in my yep. mid twenties. That's what you're talking and, about. And uh, it kind of became after that that I started noticing that kind of shift of my jaw. It gave me kind of a crooked smile. Partly it was neurological, I think, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, I bet there's, as we talked about with that shift and everything, I'm quite sure part yeah. of it is simply a shift that is, you know, correctable. And, yep. You know. You know, Nobody I was talking to fix it back then. Yeah, I was talking to um, a chiropractor that I know, and uh, I, I also talked to a uh, dentist about some of this stuff. And it'd be interesting to see what dental appliances, or excuse me, uh, what uh, like braces or orthodontics, how that affects uh, the the jaw mechanics, and how sometimes perhaps the jaw mechanics may be affecting your bite, which then would affect your like your teeth. So I'm, I wonder how pathological the TMCCs are in kids who need braces, and how perhaps the jaw mechanics are affecting the teeth, and the, which would affect the bite, and it cause like crowding of teeth and certain types of pathologies within the mouth itself. Because I know Dr. Ron Ruska has been speaking to uh, dentists for years now, and kind of opening their eyes up to uh, the 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 you know the causes and ideology of the pathologies that they see in their patients yeah yeah i think that's a i mean it has to have a significant effect when you come to understand how the, everything chains together absolutely um, and uh, yeah yeah it goes pretty like we talked about last time it goes pretty far down the rabbit hole but pretty far down the rabbit hole vision you know so now you have optometrist and then yeah dental exactly and then, <laughs> So, um, speaking of all those things, vision, dental, uh, uh, doctors, that kind of thing, uh, an article was put out. I sent it to you. I think this is just the synopsis was from, uh, the morning chalk up. I'll give them credit for that. It was a synopsis of, um, an interview with 
uh, Greg Glassman, who's the founder of CrossFit. And uh, you, you got a chance to read it, Scott. You want to just kind of give us a brief overview of what this article is all about? Yeah, so basically talked about the coming major changes for the, the CrossFit Games. Um, the gist of it is from the article was that they want to de-emphasize the games and kind of um, promote more of a health aspect of CrossFit. And by doing that, they're going to move the Opens to October next year. There will still be 2019 Opens in February, but there will also be 2019 Opens in October for the 2020 season. And no more regionals. There'll be other partnering with other, I guess, non-CrossFit events to qualify individuals like Wadapalooza and others. And one man, one woman, one team from each country get in. So a much larger field. And uh, just, you know, in chatting about it with people here at the gym this morning, a lot of first reaction is, I wonder how many competitors are going to move to Ghana and you know, Tanzania, Uzbekistan, and you know, yeah. these places to, to get a uh, get a get a road in because mm-hmm. that's going to you know countries that typically qualify a lot of people and a lot of teams are going to be a little out of luck. Yeah, yeah. like namely, namely uh, USA, for example. But, USA, Canada, Australia. You're like, oh, those those big ones for sure. But even. I mean, even some of the Scandinavian countries, for example, you know? Absolutely. Iceland, good luck. What's going to happen with Iceland? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, uh, so what was your thought in terms of them now emphasizing CrossFit health rather than the competitive atmosphere of CrossFit? Because it seems like CrossFit in a lot of people's minds, when you ask the average person, they tell you about, oh yeah, I know that Rich Froning guy, or I know that Annie Goddard or something. But they don't Everyone seems speak to know about the first about, oh, it's a training methodology or, mm-hmm. um, you know, oh, I knew a guy who lost 100 pounds doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So emphasizing now the CrossFit health, what, what is that? What do you think? The, how are they going how to How are be, they going to do this? Okay. Uh, because we have a, you know, we see this vehicle, ESPN and others, or whoever they partnered with over the years to mm-hmm. get the, the broadcast out. People are going to watch that, but they're not going to have shows about CrossFit for health. I'm going to assume that are going to play mm-hmm. on unless they're going to start buying infomercials or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. How is that going to be? Or is there idea that, you know, there's more people can qualify from a, from an average box. It seemed almost kind of like what he was trying to do, but this is depends on where you're at, right? In the countries mm-hmm. it's brand new. Yes. Then it does create a possibility to get into the games kind of like probably like how it was around here a decade ago, mm-hmm. but for places that CrossFit has been now for a while, you know, now it makes it even harder yet to get there. I would assume. So, um, the first I thing I want to emphasize is health. <laughs> yeah. The first thing I want to address is the fact that one, so it, it's seen that it's pretty evident that, um, Greg Glassman himself has a mission and a purpose, and that's to, uh, he has found that CrossFit is um, abo- uh, uh, more important to him than proving the fittest man or woman on earth and team on earth is that it's the most elite fitness regimen on earth. And he's seen day in, day out in the exploration of the affiliates that they're doing the most important work in health and wellness in the world. Um, the pretty cool thing that, that he points out in the article is that there's 15,000 affiliates worldwide and the growth of the affiliates in the last 10 years, uh, surpasses that of some of the biggest restaurant chains in the world. He, he, they quote Domino's and I think Dunkin' Donuts and I think like seven times as many Chipotle's or something. Taco Bell or something. It's unbelievable. And when I read that, I'm like, holy shit, that's pretty significant. Yeah. Now you may not have the number of customers as some of those have, but I guarantee the impact on those individuals' lives when they come into a CrossFit is far more significant than those who go into a Dunkin' Donuts. Sure, yeah. I think that say you had 15,000 affiliates worldwide, and let's say on average each of those affiliates had, let's say, 100 just to make the math easy. Sure. So that's 15,000 times 100. By my calculations, what's that? 1.5 million people? Okay, so is that... I don't know. That yeah, might be well, bro, bro science if, there. 
That's that's oh no, yeah, it is, it is. Because yeah, yeah, if yeah, zero, it's they only 000. had ten, then they would be 150,000. <laughs> yeah, so it's a hundred each. So yeah. that's 1.5 million people worldwide. Yeah. That obviously you like when you look at it on a global scale, you're like 1.5 million people when you know that's not doing anything. But because you've got yeah, I mean, billions. you know, because you have a seven billion person population, right. but <clears throat> each one of those people technically could be a walking billboard for CrossFit. So that's 1.5 million people. And we know what CrossFitters are like. They are walking billboards. They're going to tell you about it. They're going to educate people. They're the most knowledgeable people about health and wellness. If you sat down among some average, like just avid, you know, fitness enthusiasts, not even fitness enthusiasts, but people who just like are not sedentary. Yeah. So what I, th- what I think is probably going to happen because I've seen – because Pat Sherwood put up a post about two weeks ago about how or why he wasn't part of the broadcast during the CrossFit Games. And he had been chosen by Greg Glassman as one of the apostles, I guess, to start uh, preaching the gospel of CrossFit health because he has uh, been doing the level one certifications for quite some time. He's a very knowledgeable and very well-known guy within the community, but I think he has a passion for the health side of it uh, relative to some of the uh, CrossFit Games type stuff that he's been doing. So they've taken, I think, because they said they downsized their, or they some people quoted as firing the media team for the CrossFit Games, like a quarter of them or 20%. I think like, yeah, quite, I heard that separately after we talked. But I think what they're probably doing is just repurposing them. They're probably just going to pull them over. If they, if they don't have the ability to do the, the CrossFit health type stuff, they're going to pull uh, – they're going to kind of get rid of them. But if they have the ability, they'll probably just pull them over and just re- repurpose them in terms of, of growing the CrossFit health. But imagine – and this is something that you know Rob Wolf has talked about a bunch of times. Chris Kresser has talked about a bunch of times. But – Doing a network of affiliates within in either an area or within CrossFit in general, where they have healthcare practitioners at connected to all CrossFits. So you are an affiliate within your area. There's healthcare practitioners, both MDs, Kairos, PTs, nutritionists that are uh, quote you know uh, uh, part of the CrossFit family that could potentially start changing not only uh, the, the the paradigm of just the way the CrossFits run, but as healthcare runs. So you don't, you're not just going into a CrossFit, you're coming into a health and wellness facility. And that's kind of what we've been doing for quite some time now, Scott, would you say? We're a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, us believing that really – human performance and CrossFit really isn't the end all be all. We think I would say that health fitness, uh, fitness, wellness, and longevity is probably mm-hmm. a lot better off selling it to a general population. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cause of the, the number of people that want to compete is really quite small. Yeah. In the overall scope of, you know, the, what your client is going to be. And, uh, and I know that's like we've, chatted about this numerous times in the past but over the years uh you know they are i think all of our average clientele has changed a little bit when it was a new thing edgy you know yeah a lot of people were more competitive more interested in that but now that it's been much more mainstream most people are there for health wellness longevity you know yep not yep and it it, it kind of coincides with the the uh enthusiasm or the uh business plan and business model of what CrossFit is doing in general. So if you believe that uh, human performance is the end all be all, then you're going to push the open. You're going to push the regionals. You're going to push the CrossFit games, but it's seeing now that it's a professional sport. And I think they basically said, okay, this is going to be the sport, which is kind of like, I mean, this is nothing to really compare it to just because it's so different. But I mean, uh, I mean, a recreational versus I mean, or, or, or professional sport versus uh, health and wellness. I think this is really right. the fork in the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the other thing that comes to mind when, when we think about this and when we look at this is that uh, this could be potentially revolutionary and this could potentially change the game because the only other thing that I could think of that has uh, community and wellness – in one kind of one stop is places like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig. 
right? Mm -hmm. So imagine you took something like that, which again has enormous following. Like those places have tons of people who sign up for Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers. Like they're mm -hmm. billion dollar companies. I don't, you right. know, I wouldn't think that CrossFit in itself is, is, is that capacity, but imagine you had something like that, that had the community that had the best minds and the most cutting edge research and, and, uh, ideas. But then you also had this fitness methodology, um, done in proper ways that allowed people to, to come into a one-stop shop where they can get their fitness, their um, their healthcare work, um, and then the aspects of community all in one place. And this is something that community in general, um, needs. Mm -hmm. This is a direct response toward 325 million people having some of the worst health in the world, yet having all of the resources to have good health. This is a response mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. You know, yeah, it'll be uh, exciting to see, uh, to hear, hear what some of the, uh, you know, the actual concrete action steps are going to be toward going this direction. Yeah. I, I, I believe someone said to me that, uh, Greg Glassman would rather spend 25 million, lose $25 million pushing CrossFit health than lose $25 million pushing CrossFit, uh, the sport. Hmm. And I would completely, completely be on board with that. I think you're going to get a lot more like change, significant change. Um, we were, I was talking to my, uh, my partner, uh, Myra about that. And I was like, how many people have come in in the last six months saying they want to be the next rich Ferroni? relative mm -hmm. to how many people in the last six months have come in that says, my doctor says I have to get in shape. Right. Right. What's yeah. making the money. Yeah. So I think we've hit the ceiling in terms of, or the, or at least they've seen the, the high water mark either here or in the near future for what CrossFit the sport is. And they're mm -hmm. like, there's no growth there. The growth is the 325 million people in this country and the 7 billion people worldwide who have no perception of what balance is in terms of health, wellness, and longevity, and then whatever their career and life is. Mm-hmm. So I think in a lot of ways, this is good for CrossFit affiliates. I think this yeah. is a, is this could possibly reinvigorate CrossFit in general, because everything's a, everything has its heyday. Everything kind of has its spark yeah. and then it comes up and like, ah, it's cool. And then it, you know, what's the next fad? I think exactly. this is something that could sustain this for a long time. Yeah. Kind of need, yeah, it's definitely probably needed at least in, in countries where it's more established. Mm -hmm. Um, because been kind of in need of some sort of a spark for a while. Yep. I feel like it's been, you know, flat for a few years for sure, you know? Yeah. One other thing that we, that I think what they'll probably utilize is, um, physician networks that allow you to Skype or, uh, do some kind of FaceTime mm -hmm. for healthcare. So you just go to a lab core, get your blood work done and have it sent to a healthcare practitioner. So if you're in the state of Florida, you have, let's say, a, uh, and you belong to an affiliate in Florida, there is a bunch of docs. Maybe you find one within your area, or maybe there's not one in your area. You're 30 miles away from a functional medicine doctor or 50 miles away. And you're like, I can't get there. So you go to a lab core, it's sent to them, all the results. And then they look over your results and they prescribe something based upon what those results are. So now we're using technology mm -hmm. and you cut down on the cost because now you don't have to go for a medical visit. Um, and yeah. most likely it's probably a lot more beneficial and a lot less red tape for doctors. So like, yeah, it might be a little bit more of an upfront cost, but now you're not, I mean, like right now I go to see a functional medicine doctor, the blood draw is like 30 bucks. And then I think the consultation is 125. So mm -hmm. for $155 every three months, I'm getting a full workup of what I have, what's going on in my body and a really good picture. And then any interventions that I have for there are done very conservatively because we're doing this on the front end, not at the back end. Yeah. And I think it's like, there's some ridiculous statistic, again, bro science, but I'll ch fact check myself on this one. I believe 90% of all healthcare costs are in the last six months of a person's life. Yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. It may be a myth, but I've heard it quoted before from other people, but it, it I mean, it's a bit of a loaded kind of statement. Mm -hmm. 
just because, you know, when people are dying, you're going to spend a lot more money to keep them alive, right? Right. But but in general, though, let's just take a person who's morbidly obese with type 2 diabetes and all towards, sorts of core morbid, morbidities with that, um, um, you know, metabolic syndrome, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. How much is it cost for medication for those people? Insulin. How much is it going to cost to cut their foot off? How much is it going to cost to get dialysis? Like tens of thousands of dollars monthly. So not only are you putting the burden on the, the taxpayer and potentially, uh, you know, the per- people around you, but then you're also putting the burden upon yourself because eventually – Maybe those dollars run out in terms of your insurance and you can't pay for that. And then it has to come out of pocket. So because of the uh, lack of foresight going, you know, in the long term, it's like that saying uh, with Homer Simpson, he goes, uh, uh, you know, he's about to like drink, a beer, eat a bunch of food or drink a bunch of beer. And he goes, ah, he goes, aren't you going to feel terrible later? He goes, ah, that's future Homer's problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that's not my problem. That's future Sean's problem. That's future Scott's problem. That's not yeah. my problem. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of the time what we think about. We don't. We don't. We know. Mm-hmm. Oh man, one hundred twenty-five dollars for a console. Holy shit, that's a lot of money. I'm like, well, how much money do you have when you're when you get cancer, when you get heart problems, when all those things happen, and now you're on a list? Like, how much money are you willing to give for an extra year of your life? You know what I mean? Like you would give anything at that point, but we, we can't see that now because we're kind of have that, uh, idea that we're invincible right now, but you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's hard to make sacrifices right now for an undetermined, uh, you know, future situation. Exactly. Yeah. And I think everyone thinks that they'll get a easier pass than maybe others they know, but that is not something to gamble on. Yeah, and, and, and you know, <clears throat> I think there's also there it, – it's like a, a, for every dollar that you spend on prevention, it's $7 toward – you know what I mean? Like there's such like yeah. uh, value in, in, in putting upfront uh, investment in terms of, 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 of care for your health. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I am by no means a millionaire. Um, I am actually still paying student loans off as we speak. I'm getting closer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to things that are valuable for me, and I guess that's kind of like an assessment about myself. Like you have to actually sit down and talk to yourself about that and just be like, yo, what's val- really valuable to me? So let me ask you that question there, Scott. What's valuable to you? Yeah. Uh, I'm not much on a person of things. I've enjoyed mm-hmm. experiences more, but certainly – health. I mean, obviously my family and their health is super yep. important to me. Uh, but I would try, you know, I, 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 I look at, you know, people with big houses or fancy cars. And I'm like, eh, it just interests me. Not at all. I mean, if they want to do that, it's fine. But I, I would rather invest, you know, in my own health, whether that's eating good food, getting enough testing so that I know, you know, if something's going, trending in the wrong direction, I can address it education to, to know more because there's always new things to learn about health um that outweighs you know i mean i already feel you know super blessed i feel like i've had two you know i've told my the youthful years that most people get you know i'm still out doing tricks on a bike i'm still doing these things that you know people would have stopped doing decades ago and uh that's any any effort if you sweat in the gym every you know morning joint mobility every time mm-hmm. i eat you know said no to some sort of food i shouldn't have and yes to something good and it's all worth it for that it's yeah I mean, feeling feeling good and you know still feeling uh you know like you've got a lot left in you yep and uh and being able to take care of yourself and not burdening anyone around you with, you know, um, you know, I believe you truly need help, you know, that's okay. But a lot of people certainly uh, unnecessarily um, put a lot of their care into other, onto other people yep. by not having done their diligence and taking care of themselves. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Scott. Um, obviously, you, you've had tons of members over time. And, um, you probably have some of them go to doctors that you recommend, or they, maybe they come back from their own doctor. Um, I'll share with my experience and let's see if you have the same, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the people who go to the doctor, usually they come back and their blood work 
on like standard markers is remarkable. Like blood pressure, great. Um, you know, lipids are great. Like all those standard things, blood pressure, all those things are usually very good. Do you find that in lots of your uh, members, Scott? Yeah, mostly in general. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you know, go ahead. That's uh, oh, you say yeah. We've had you know over the years. I mean, who knows how many members have been you know here for a while and almost fourteen years now, and uh, uh, it's similar story. You know, all down the line. You know, very good, very good uh, checkups with the doctor. Very excellent. Um, you know, the only cases I would say different are the people that, um, either it was in the early years when we didn't really know better or people that have come in having trained out somewhere else for a long time and are clearly quite overtrained or eating, you know, overly restricted diet. Sometimes you see some rather South numbers with those folks, but mm -hmm. that's a bit of a small population. So I would say, uh, and again, like by no means are all of the members that I come across, examples of, of, of unbelievable health, but they're not sick. Right. One in three people are either pre-diabetic or diabetic in the United States. We spend more money than any country on the world on healthcare. And we have the sickest people mm -hmm. and not sick in the sense that like, Oh, we have like people dying because they don't have clean water. We don't have people sick because they can't get enough food. We have people who are sick because one, they're misinformed and two, I guess the easiest, the, the most accurate way of saying it is it's not a priority. Mm -hmm. Health, wellness, and longevity is not a priority within our society. So we have one in three people who are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. However, the people who come into our facilities, be honest with you, we rarely see that. Would you say, would you agree? Yeah. So obviously there's selection bias, but by default, if you're coming into a CrossFit, either you're going to recover enough that you're out of the pre-diabetic, diabetic spectrum, or you have cared enough about your health to that point that you are out of that hundred plus million people. Exactly. And the, I believe 284 million, let me see. Uh, economic cost of diabetes in the U S in 2012 was 245 billion, 245 billion in 2012. That's six years ago and has not gotten better. Let me tell you that. So yeah. Yeah. if everybody would take a look at themselves, including those of mem members of Congress and, uh, and the Senate and all those things, we say, we're in an economic crisis. We got to spend less money and we got to do, how about we look at what we're putting into our body. How about we look at what we're doing with our body and stop being hypocrites. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really cared about the dollars that you were spending and the taxpayers dollars, you would look at all those things that you potentially could control. That's no one's pointing a gun at you. Mm -hmm. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean that would be a, that would be a certainly smart and it'd be a step toward in the right direction for the future for sure. But I don't know if I hold out a lot of hope given <laughs> that you know there's so much economically riding on a lot of people being sick, both yeah. the people providing the food that puts them there, both and then the medical establishment to treat the in theory treat the problem. Yep. But also even uh, the way our workforce is designed, right? It's a lot of people, I mean, you have to work a lot more hours than 40 hours to make ends meet in a lot of cases. And it's really difficult to move enough you know, yeah. for, for people. And that's a problem, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, I think obviously this could potentially could be a bipartisan issue. Listen, I don't get like to get in politics anymore. I had yeah. my heyday of politics, but it's kind of like when, when, uh, Mr. Rogers sat in front of Congress to like plead his case for public funding for, for PBS. He was like, listen, there's kids who come home and they, this is how they like, this is their, their parent in some ways. And this is the way that they get educated and that kind of stuff. And it was like heartbreaking. And Congress is like, dude, we'll give you the money if you need it. But like, just imagine there's, there's so much of an economic incentive to remedy this problem. Like if you're a conservative, 
and you're like, I, I, you know, we got, we're blowing up this deficit. We got to, you know, drop, you know, be more conservative in terms of spending. And naturally conservatives also believe that the individual has the ability to kind of, you know, shape their own lives. I think, you know, I, it's, you know, uh, uh, don't tread on me type of philosophy, then th- you'd be right on board with this. And if you're more of a, uh, you know, more of a, a lefty liberal where it's like, you know, everybody's together in this, wouldn't you want to do your best possible so that other people aren't burdened by your um, lack of knowledge, by your lack of courage to do something that's not normal? So mm-hmm. theoretically, you know, in some ways, in a lot of places, stuff. having diabetes is normal. That's effed oh, yeah. up, man. Yeah. That's effed yeah. up. And, and again, yeah. like perpetuating, perpetuating the, the thought that it is a, uh, a weakness or that it's your lesser or uh, that's not going to help. Pointing no. fingers and uh, telling people that they're, they're uh, inferior, it's not the way to do it. However, if there's one community that I've ever been a part of that has shown that it doesn't matter what you look like, what size you are, what gender you are. If there's one community that has embraced diversity and of, of all different types, it's, it's the CrossFit community. Mm-hmm. This is true. Yeah. You know, how many people have this you come the- across of all different shapes, sizes, and colors oh, that yeah. you're just like, you know what, when we get in here, we're all the same. We're all the same. Yep. We all do this together. And yep. We yep. all, we all do this together. Here. Yep. I like that. I like that. All right, Scotty. Um, I think that's probably good for today. You got anything else? I know that'll do, but I bet we'll know a little more maybe by next go next Can't week. Can't wait, man. Can't wait. I think this is a pretty cool topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm Sean LaFlock. You can get me at Sean at CrossFit DelrayBeach.com. I'm Scott Hagnes. You get me at Scott at CrossFitPortland.com. Scotty, good talking to you, brother. I'll talk to you next good week. Good talking to you. Yeah, talk to you next week. Later.